Hipsters. So we're going to be thinking then about Isaac over the next five days, God willing. To begin with, I want to start in Malachi. If you'll come with me to Malachi chapter 4, please. It's Malachi chapter 4 and verse 4 says, Remember ye the law of Moses my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel, with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of Yahweh, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. And what we've got, isn't it, is a prophecy of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, of the coming again of Elijah, of the gathering of Israel, of the bringing of them into their land. And the basis upon which Israel come into the land, the characteristics which they are supposed to show when they are in the kingdom are the characteristics of the fathers. He shall turn, says verse 6, the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers. The nation of Israel in the land are going to reflect the character of their fathers, of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. And so this week, God willing, brothers and sisters, we're going to think about one of these fathers. We're going to think about the father that possibly we, we skip over. We consider, don't we, the faith of Abraham and the dramatic events that are in, come in his life. We think, don't we, of Jacob and the, the trials and the moulding which God does with that man. And Isaac gets sort of lost in the shuffle. We can jump straight from Abraham to Jacob. We're going to think about Isaac this week. We're going to see the way in which the character of Isaac is going to help us to prepare for the kingdom. Is going to help us as we walk towards that kingdom. But what we're going to see, brothers and sisters, most of all, is the wonderful way in which the life and the character of Isaac is portrayed for us selectively. The scripture pulls out events in his life which point forward to the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaac is shown to be the typical son of Abraham who was the father. Abraham then stands as a type of God in these things and Isaac as his son. Excellent. And so we've got there then a little rundown of Genesis 17 through to 24 as it relates to the life of Isaac. And what you can see is Genesis 17 and 18 point forward to us and look for Isaac who is promised and named before he is born. Genesis 21 looks at the birth of Isaac and then the persecution which he receives at the hands of his brethren. <coughs> In Genesis chapter 22, Isaac dies and is raised again in a figure. And in Genesis 24 then, Isaac returns to us and is presented with a bride who has been chosen for him by the servants of his father. And we can see, can't we, immediately just with that overview that Isaac stands as a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, that these events, which are all we have about Isaac up to Genesis 24, up to the age at which he is <coughs> at least 40 when he's married to Rebecca, that's all we have of the first 40 years, his birth and the events surrounding that, his death and then the presentation of a bride. And so we will see, brothers and sisters, as we go through the wonderful way in which Isaac is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's Genesis 17 we're interested in this morning. So let's have a look then at Genesis chapter 17 and verse 1. <clears throat> Genesis 17 and verse 1 says, When Abraham was 99 years old, Yahweh appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. 
Abraham then was 90 years old and nine. He was 99 at the beginning of Genesis 17. And it's interesting the emphasis that comes on the ages in this chapter. If you have a look at verse 17 of Genesis 17, Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is 90 years old? Bear. Verse 24 tells us that Abraham was 90 years old and nine when he was circumcised. And we're told in verse 25 that Ishmael, his son, was 13. We're given ages throughout this chapter to emphasize to us the age specifically of Abraham and Sarah. And we know, don't we, the end of, verse six, the end of chapter 16 tells us that Abraham was 86 when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abraham. So there's this 13 year gap between these two chapters. 13 years in which Abraham was waiting. God had said, Ishmael isn't the one. You will have a son. He will be through Sarah. And 13 years went by before that son was even promised again to Abraham in Genesis chapter 17, and it's 14 years before finally he is born. And it's an example, isn't it, brothers and sisters, for us, of the long suffering of Abraham here, but of God in particular, waiting for that time when his purpose will be fulfilled. And 13 years is, is interesting. Just come back to Genesis and chapter 14. Because in Genesis chapter 14, <clears throat> we're told about the rebellion of the kings that are named in verse 1. It came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Elassa, Kedorlaomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations, that these made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and with Beersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Admar, and Shemeba, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, which is Zoar. They all joined together because in verse 4, they had served Kedor Laoma 12 years. And in the 13th year, they couldn't take it anymore. And so they rebelled. 13 years was too much for them. But not for Abraham, brothers and sisters, who waited 13 years. And in the 14th year, <coughs> received a son. And we are told that Yahweh appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am the almighty God. The almighty God, the Hebrew is El Shaddai. I'm sure we all know. Brother Thomas wrote this. As often as this word El passed before Abram's mind, the idea of power, might and strength would stand out in bold relief. Nebuchadnezzar in Ezekiel 31 is styled El Goim the mighty one of the nations. In Isaiah 9, Messiah is termed El Gibor, the mighty warrior. And so Abraham is being brought, Abram here, is being brought to consider and to comprehend the power of Almighty God. The one appearing to Abraham was a powerful God, was a God who could perform and it was this power, wasn't it, that Abraham had his faith in that God was able to perform what he had promised to him. And now that revelation is made. But the Thomas goes on to talk about Shaddai. The word is plural and comes from the root Shaddad to be strong or powerful. And so it signifies mighty or powerful ones in case Abraham hadn't already got the idea. Several appeared to Abraham and three of them at one time condescended to partake of his hospitality. Their power is tremendous when they choose to exert it upon the wicked. But towards the heirs of salvation, they are ministering spirits, beneficent and good. And just note, brothers and sisters, that for this family... For the family of Abraham and the patriarchs, El Shaddai was a beneficent power. It was a powerful God who was able to perform for them those things which they needed. And we get this title coming up throughout the lives of the patriarchs. So we have it here in Genesis 17 verse 1. In Genesis 28, when Isaac is speaking to Jacob, the title is used again. In Genesis 35 and in Genesis 48, it also 
is used. And each one of those times, it is used in the context of God multiplying this family. So Genesis 17, if you're there, just have a look at verse 2. God has appeared to him, said to him, I am the almighty God. And in verse 2, I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. This is the title of God, brothers and sisters, who multiplies his family upon the earth. <coughs> the title of God who is bringing his purpose to pass by multiplying those people who believe and have faith in him. There is another occasion in the life of the patriarchs where the title is used. It's Genesis 43 and verse 13. And there it's used not in the context of multiplication because the family has been multiplied at that point. The multiplication has happened. And so in that, Genesis 43, verse 13, Jacob is then entrusting his family to the protective power of the Almighty God. And Abraham is told in verse 1 of Genesis 17, to walk before me and be thou perfect. And there were lessons there, weren't there? And examples for us, brothers and sisters, in that our life in the truth, Abraham's life in the truth, was a walk. God doesn't say, sit before me. God doesn't say, stand before me and we'll discuss. Abraham was to walk before God. Just come back and have a look at Genesis chapter 3. Because I think that the point is being made from Genesis chapter 3 here to Abram. <coughs> Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8. Adam and Eve heard the voice of Yahweh Elohim walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Yahweh. Adam and Eve could not walk before God in the garden because of the sin and the shame which they felt because of that sin. God was walking and they couldn't walk. That word presence, the same word as before in Genesis 17. Because of their sin, Adam and Eve were unable to walk before Yahweh. And this is what God is counselling Abraham to avoid. This is what God is saying, <coughs> don't make their mistake. Don't fall into that trap. And it's interesting, brothers and sisters, because this idea of walking and being perfect forms part of a set of links that we have between Genesis 17 and Colossians. If you'll come over to Colossians chapter 1 and have a quick look there. So Abram is told to walk before Yahweh and to be thou perfect. Just note verse 10 of Colossians chapter 1. It's the prayer which the Apostle Paul offers for his brothers and sisters in Colossae. And he prays that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long-suffering with joyfulness. Walk worthy, praise the Apostle Paul. And in verse 28 of Colossians chapter 1, whom we preach, talking about Christ, warning every man and teaching man ev every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect. In Christ Jesus. Walk worthy and be perfect, says Colossians. And you've got the other, the other references, the other links there between Genesis 17 and what's going on in Colossians. The idea of the inheritance, the land for an everlasting possession, comes up in Colossians chapter 1, verse 12, where we are made meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Obviously, Genesis 17 is the introduction of circumcision. 
which Colossians 2 is going to spend some verses considering. We have the idea in verse 13 of Genesis 17 of those who are bought with thy money. Colossians 1 verse 14 tells us we are redeemed. We are bought by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Abraham laughs. He rejoices because of the promise that's made unto him. And we saw when we read verse 11 of Colossians 1 that we are to be strengthened with all might in all patience and long-suffering with joyfulness. Abraham, brothers and sisters, was long-suffering in his waiting for Isaac and rejoiced when that promise was made. There's another one that, that actually didn't make it onto the table. Um, really should have done. If you have a look at verse 10 again of Colossians chapter 1, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work. And that was the promise that was made to Abraham in verse 6 of Genesis 17. I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And so we've got then Colossians using Genesis 17 as the basis for a number of the points that it makes. The Spirit takes us in, from, in Colossians back to Genesis 17 and says, look at the promise of Isaac, the institution of circumcision, and the blessings that were made to Abraham. And we ask the question, why? What, what's going on here? Well, we know, don't we, that Colossians has to do with the new creation being through the life and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have that section from verse 14 of Colossians chapter 1, where we are told we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature or all creation. Verse 16, for in him were all things created. And that, that word by, the, the Greek word should be translated in. It, it's a picture of those who have been baptized, who have put on Christ and are now in Christ. Who make up then the new creation <coughs> in heaven, in earth, visible and invisible, thrones, dominions, principalities and powers. All things were created by or through him and for him. Christ then is the beginning of the new creation, the start of that process whereby God fills the earth with those people who manifest his glory. And that process is pictured in type in Genesis 17 and then the life of Isaac. And Isaac is pictured as the one through whom that covenant can be made, through whom the new creation can come. And so Colossians 1, the Spirit tells the Colossian brothers and sisters and tells us, have a look at Genesis 17, see what it says. I want you to come back to Genesis in chapter 6, please. Because along with Colossians, Genesis chapter 17 is based on the life of Noah. Time after time we get reference back to events in the flood. You'll probably have picked up Genesis 17 verse 1. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And in Genesis 6 verse 9 we're told that these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. And God says to Abraham, just look at the way Noah lived. There is your example. There is the one you should consider. And again, brothers and sisters, we're not, we're not going to go through the whole table. But there are a number of links taking us back from Genesis 17 to the life of Noah from Genesis 6 through to Genesis 9, which make up a, a set of connections, which again bring us to the idea and the point that Genesis 17 is to do with the new creation and a new beginning. God saw the evil on the earth in Genesis 6 and says, we've got to start again. Noah, you're the man. We're going to start with you. And in Genesis 17, we get the promise of the one through whom that covenant 
that new creation, the coming of the family of God whom he is multiplying, we get that set up in time in the promise of Isaac. I'm going to carry on then, back in Genesis 17. There's the next table between Genesis 17 and Noah. <clears throat> Genesis 17, verse 2, where God says, I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him saying and just note again the reversal with genesis 3 genesis 3 abraham adam and eve heard the voice and hid themselves they didn't want to talk with god they couldn't bear to face up to him but abraham is prepared to face and to talk with god as for me says god in verse 4 behold my covenant is with thee and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee, and I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And we have, don't we, the, the sixth of the blessings which God, of the promises which God is going to make to Abraham. This is number six here, the final one, comes in Genesis 22, which we'll consider on Wednesday, God willing, the seventh set of blessings. And God says in verse 7, I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I want you to notice in Genesis 17, the way in which this phrase, thy seed after thee, recurs again. And again, we have it there in verse 7 twice. We have it in verse 8. I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee. We have it in verse 9. Thou and thy seed after thee. In verse 10. Between me and you and thy seed after thee. And then in verse 19, when the promise is then extended unto Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him these promises brothers and sisters are the promises for the seed abraham was to enjoy them abraham was to be part of them but they are looking forward to his seed now is going to come the time when abraham is going to be brought to see his seed the one who was promised to him god said in verse 6 I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. Exceeding fruitful, nations, and kings. Now come and look at verse 15, where God now speaks to Abraham concerning Sarah. Having changed Abraham's name, having made Abraham the promises. God now says unto Abraham in verse 15, As for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. And I will bless her, and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be, get rid of a mother of, it's not there, she shall be nations, kings of people shall be of her. And just look at the way in which those two promises marry up from verse 6 and verse 16. Exceeding fruitful, said God to Abraham, I will give thee a son also of her. I will make nations of thee, and she shall be nations. And kings shall come out of thee. Kings of people shall be of her and it's wonderful the way in which abraham and sarah marry up in the promises that were made abraham and sarah were heirs together and it comes out in the way sarah is continuously and repetitively called abraham's wife 
And so we've got it in verse 15. And God said unto Abraham, as for Sarai thy wife. Now, Abraham knew who his wife was. He'd lived with her for a number of years. And yet God again repeats this idea. As for Sarai thy wife. Just in case Abraham might have forgotten that that was who his wife was. And just interestingly, up to this point in the record, Sarah has been called Abraham's wife 11 times altogether. Abraham didn't need to be told this, did he? But God is making the point. Sarah is your wife. Sarah is the one through whom the promised child is going to come. Sarah is the one through whom the child of the covenant is going to come. Don't call her Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. And in verse 17, Abraham's reaction is wonderful, isn't it? Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed. And said in his heart, shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? And it's interesting, we know, don't we, that this is a totally different reaction, though couched in exactly the same terms, as Sarah's reaction from Genesis 18. Sarah laughs and says, really? No. Abraham laughs because he believes. We know this because of Romans chapter 4. If you come across and have a look at Romans chapter 4, we have the Spirit's exposition of what's going on here in terms of the promise and the birth of Isaac. In Romans chapter 4, we're introduced to the idea of circumcision, the giving of the token of the covenant to Abraham. Romans 4 verse 11 calls it a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised that he might be the father of all them that believe. And so circumcision is brought to our view. And then Romans 4 goes on. Verse 17, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be as though they were, which be not as though they were, sorry. Who against hope, speaking about Abraham, believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And so we know in this act, when Abraham falls on his face again, he's already done it once in the chapter, when he falls on his face and when he laughs and when he says, shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? It is an act giving glory to God is what Romans 4 says. Because of Abraham's belief that God was able to perform because Abraham had understood the lesson of the powerful one who was able to bring his promise to bear. He fell on his face and he laughed and he gave glory to God. It shows, brothers and sisters, doesn't it, the faith of Abraham, staggering not in unbelief, recognizing that though he was dead, though his wife's womb was dead, God could give them life. And it's the same faith that we need, isn't it, brothers and sisters? It's the same faith that we have to hold on to. It's the same recognition that we need that even though we are dead in trespasses and sins, yet God has quickened us and made us alive. And it's that life that we need to hold on to and hold fast to. And in verse 18, back in Genesis 17, having glorified God in his reaction of faith, 
Abraham says, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. It takes us back, doesn't it, to verse 1. Walk before me and be thou perfect, God had said to Abraham. And now Abraham saying, if only Ishmael would live before thee. There's only one other occurrence of, of the words that come together. And they're in Hosea. Come and have a look at Hosea in chapter 6. Hosea 6 and verse 1. Come and let us return unto Yahweh, for he hath torn and he will heal us. He hath smitten and he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up and we shall live before him in his sight, as the AV has revised version, before him. In his presence is exactly the same phrase. Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. Verse 3, then shall we know, if we follow on to know Yahweh, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain upon the earth. And it's a picture, isn't it, of the kingdom. And again, Israel gathered together. God has torn them, but he's going to heal them up. God has smitten them, but he's going to bind them up. He's going to revive them and raise them up. It's the valley of dry bones from Ezekiel, isn't it? And then... They are going to live before him as a spiritual, as a covenant people. And the point is, brothers and sisters, Abraham prays that Ishmael might live in that way. We know that he doesn't. But Abraham prays that Ishmael might. And it's an indication to us of the type that Israel, that, that, that Ishmael, is typical of because as we go through the allegory and we're going to look at Galatians chapter 4 later on in the week we're going to see that Ishmael stands as a type of natural Israel Ishmael was the one who did not live before God and so was cast out and sent away because of that and Hosea 6 says there will come a time when Israel will live before God. Vast swathes of their history, they refuse to. But there will come a time when Israel will. When they will be brought back and they will be brought up. And they will be raised. And when they will live before him. And Abraham prays that that might be the case with Ishmael. That Ishmael might live in a spiritual manner in this life that he might at least be granted a place in the kingdom. But God says in verse 19, Sarah, thy wife, shall bear thee a son indeed. And the revised version makes it a, a, a negative, a cutting off of verse 18. The revised version has, and God said, nay, but Sarah, thy wife, shall bear thee a son the emphasis of God is with the child of promise. It's not going to be Ishmael. Isaac is the one. Sarah, thy wife, shall bear thee a son. Note the fundamental position of Sarah. Young's literal translation has, Sarah, thy wife, is certainly bearing a son to thee. The promise brothers and sisters, was certain. Abraham, you don't need to worry about Ishmael. You will have a son. Sarah will bear you a son. He will live before me, is the implication there. And thou shalt call his name Isaac. And the name Isaac means laughter, doesn't it? And it's a commemoration of, of, of Abraham's response in verse 17. Abraham fell upon his face and laughed. And thou shalt call his name Isaac. Because Abraham's response, brothers and sisters, had been to give glory to God. Romans 4 said that, didn't it? 
he glorified God. And that was commemorated in the name of his son. Isaac, laughter, the glorification of God through the laughter of rejoicing and faith, which Abraham had laughed. And says God in verse 19, I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. I will establish. The word means to make to stand or to rise up. This isn't the cutting of the covenant. This isn't even back in Genesis 17 verse 2, the making of a covenant. This is the establishment. This is the setting up of the covenant. The covenant is going to stand with Isaac. Isaac is going to be the one through whom the covenant comes. Again, brothers and sisters, we see, don't we, the type of Messiah there. That Isaac was typical of Christ. The one through whom the covenant was made to stand. The one through whom, through whose blood, the covenant was ratified. I will establish my covenant with him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac. It's the same phrase as from verse 19. Ishmael will be blessed. He will receive the blessings of this life. He will be fruitful. He will multiply. There will be 12 princes. And we know Genesis 25, the end of the chapter, goes on to list those. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac. Isaac is going to be the focus. Isaac is going to be the one through whom the covenant would come. And so in verse 22, God left off talking with him and God went up from Abraham. And then we have Genesis chapter 18, don't we? Genesis chapter 18 and another appearance of Yahweh. Genesis 17 verse 1 opened. Yahweh appeared to Abraham. Genesis 18 verse 1, exactly the same. Yahweh appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. So we have another appearance, this time not for Abraham, this time for Sarah. This time it is Sarah who is going to be questioned. This time it is Sarah whose reaction is going to be measured and considered and responded to by God. These appearances from Genesis 18 and Genesis 19 and Genesis 20 are now for Sarah's benefit. Abraham believes. <coughs> it is the lack of faith in Sarah which is holding this promise back now. And so in Genesis 18, God begins to move to respond to that lack of faith verse 10 of genesis chapter 18 god said he said i will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life and lo sarah thy wife shall have a son and sarah heard it in the tent door which was behind him now abraham and sarah were old and well stricken in age and it ceased to be with sarah after the manner of women therefore sarah laughed within herself saying after i am waxed old shall i have pleasure my lord being old also and just note the exact mirroring of abraham's response the laughter the question Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? Sarah mirrors that exactly. She laughs, she asks about herself, she asks about Abraham. But this is the laughter of a lack of faith. These were real questions. This was a real doubt in Sarah's mind. And so in verse 13, Yahweh said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh? saying, shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? Is anything too hard for Yahweh? 
at the time appointed I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Then Sarah denied, saying, I laugh not, for she was afraid. And he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. She feared then, didn't she, the response of the man who had heard her, who knew what she said, despite the fact, verse 12 tells us, that she laughed within herself. And so now, the question is going to be asked and answered. Is anything too hard for Yahweh? Just come and have a look at Luke. Have a look at the Gospel of Luke in chapter 1. Because the same... Spirit, if not exactly the same words, are used to confirm the faith of Mary. Mary, having been told that she was going to have a son in even more miraculous circumstances than Sarah, is told in verse 37 of Luke chapter 1, For with God nothing shall be impossible. Or as the Revised Version translates it, For no word from God shall be void of power. Is anything too hard for Yahweh? And the answer obviously is no. God can perform. God will perform. The mighty one, the almighty God, can bring to pass his purpose. And so then Genesis 19 and Genesis 20 are going to be for the purpose of making Sarah see that nothing is too hard for him. Have you ever asked yourself the question, why it is that God decided to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah at this point, right now? Sodom and Gomorrah had been evil for a while before. They were going to continue to be evil. But God chose now. At the point at which the promises were made, at the point at which Isaac was being promised, God chose now to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And the reason is, brothers and sisters, because Sarah had to see. Because Sarah had to be brought to understand that nothing was too hard for God. And so Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain were wiped out. The almighty God, brothers and sisters, could perform he could destroy and he could nourish and genesis 19 gives us the destructive power of god to bring that about and then there's genesis 20 isn't there genesis 20 when abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country and dwelled between kadesh and shur and sojourned in girah and Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And because of this, the wombs of the women in that house were closed up. Verse 18 tells us, Yahweh had fast closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. But Abraham, through his prayer, was able to open those wombs again. Verse 17 of Genesis 20 tells us, Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maidservants, and they bear children. So in Genesis chapter 19, Sarah has been shown God can destroy. In Genesis 20, Sarah is shown but God can open wombs as well. And the last barrier, brothers and sisters, between the promise being fulfilled, the unbelief of Sarah was removed by God because of this. He showed Sarah that nothing was too hard for him. And so, brothers and sisters, tomorrow, God willing, we're going to consider the result of that. The result then of Sarah's faith and the birth of Isaac.